Bom dia. So, let's start. I'll be speaking in English for the benefit of our guests today. Um, I must obviously start by saying thank you in the name of the university for their willingness to come here to discuss with us and also to our discussants from the, from the house. And it's, uh, as you know, we are going to have the first as a sign of the future, who knows, of education, unless the future of education will involve, again, drums and signs with smoke. One possibility is that it would involve Skype, so we're going to have the first talk today through Skype, so I hope I thank very much Professor Allen for being able and willing to do this uh, in a, uh, this situation, which is not obviously the best, but we hope that Skype won't desert us and we will be able to hear precisely what you have to share with us, which is obviously very important and has to do, as the title says, about reasserting the public value of arts, humanity, and social science research. So I, what we're going to do is we're going to have the presentation by Professor Hazel Korn, and then we'll have a brief period of questions and answers so that after that we can disconnect the Skype and let Ellen go back to the things that she has to do. So thank you again so much. We are very honored that you have accepted to do this and hope that this will work well, okay? So the, the ground is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can all hear me. And I want to thank you very much and thank the, um, the people at the University of Porto and the rector for inviting me. I hope the sound is good. I'm not sure. But I will continue. So I am due to talking to you about the public value of arts and humanities research, arts and humanities and social science research. And I want to start by a couple of quotes. One looking at researchers who basically will say that the value of, of it is on human experience, agency and identity, producing literature, artifacts, and also in regard to John Brewer, who talks about public social science having an important role. On the other side, we see two different political views. One is a, potentially a joke by President Obama speaking to students who said, I assume that you will earn more money doing manufacturing regrets than you would an art history degree. And the other, the former Secretary of Education in the UK, who basically said quite famously at one stage, he didn't mind people studying medieval history, but there was no reason for the state to take them. So I want to talk about four different issues. One is about understanding the value of art, humanities, and social science research. One is defining the social contract between or looking at what this society. Two is the issue around innovation. And finally, putting forth some suggestions of how we might look at the public value of our community social science research. So AHS is our community and social science. So let's start in the first so if we were to look at any newspaper, we go to the radio, we go to the house, you're in Fort surrounded by cultural artifacts. All this is knowledge generated to a large extent by arts, humanities, and social science research, which is embedded and coded into the fabric of our lives. But questions continue to arise as to whether or not the value of that work, and particularly the value of research in the art, humanities, and social science, is valuable. We all appreciate artwork, 
but do we appreciate research in art? Fewer questions are asked about the social sciences, but it does depend on the field and the future of streaming. And there are lots of high stakes around. Many countries have limited public subsidies and humanities. Very many universities thought slow to merge our social science department. Even the European Union under societal politics has provided funding for arts, humanities, and social science, but it's been limited to be STEM research. There's a lot of efforts to harness what we call higher education research and development economic growth and recovery. And there's a big discussion going on internationally about skills and the liberal agenda. I'm wondering, can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, well, we're trying here. Oh, sorry. Now you, now you don't hear me. I'm trying to mute the local microphone to see if it, it works a little bit better. Okay? So. Because okay. it's a bit, it, it sounds not so good from my end. In your end, it's okay? No. Oh, no. Oh. Yeah. Okay, let's try. I'll, I'll mute the micro here so to see if it goes all right, okay? Okay. So if I talk about the assumptions of value, there's a common sense view that, um, that if we invest in science, technology, engineering, that we actually will spend its better value, we'll be investing in the future and progressing um, society. On the other hand, investment in arts, humanities, and social science is seen as less worthy and frivolous. Uh, there's a big argument, Mar Martha Nussbaum makes the case that if there's a big move to cut away what are seen as useless things and to st in order to stay competitive. There's a view that the arts, humanities, and social sciences pursue issues that are too remote from society. And there's a big concern in many countries, indeed in all countries, the U.S. has a huge debate on the issue as to whether or not these disciplines prepare students adequately for employability in the 21st century. I like to pose the issue in terms of um, are we, if given our limited, and we always have limited funds, would we put our money into cancer research or into studying 16th century cooking? A quite um, strange um, dichotomy, but arguably these are some of the issues out there. So there are four discourses around the public value of research in general. And a lot of the concern that's out there is that the researchers are concerned primarily with their particular situation, their own real issue of, of that they're investigating, and they're, on, they're only interested in knowledge that's applicable to society or that researchers are interested in consuming interesting ideas again, but not in innovation. Or that they're interested in excellent research rather than being inspired by what's called user problems. And that at the end of the day, the issues around academic research are only of interest to other academics and no one else is really quite interested. So how do we then define this social contract between society and research? And this is really the big issue. What is the relationship between society and research? And there have been essentially two basic sets of arguments or interpretations. One focuses to some extent on, an, on the ideological changes, a shift between the way in which the profession has dominated um, and controlled research to a new move towards a state and market control, the emphasis on managerialism, marketization, restructuring of public services. And so that kind of approach has basically emphasized entrepreneurship and industry-driven re research, emphasis on accountability. Then there's another set of issues that focuses around what we might call social contract, came about most profoundly at the end of the Second World War, again, most, most, mostly in the U.S. initially, but this realization that scientific knowledge could be competitive. 
it could provide a competitive edge for a country, for different countries. And the linking of research, particularly scientific research, to, um, to economic growth and competitiveness. So we then move to this notion that, you know, the knowledge economy, it has become the key defining characteristic or paradigm policy across Europe and around the world. And this is because new ideas, new knowledge, what we call it, is located primarily in higher education. And accordingly, university-based research, research in universities, has accordingly um, huge, huge significance. I mean, if we think about it, academics are employed because of the research that they um, produce and contribute. New knowledge is, is, within, is within academics. And um, it's also the fact that the universities have been part and parcel of this by arguing, give us more money, we're the engine of the economy. And arguably, one could say, we're now being asked, show us. Show us how you're the engine of the economy. So what we've seen is this shift, or some people might call it a rebalancing, between basic and curiosity-driven research to youth-inspired research, or what might be called application or challenge-oriented research. And there's been paralleled with a couple of other different debates going on. One is this issue about academic capitalism. It's been a prime debate within the, uh, within the higher education research literature, um, really about the way in which the academy has been linked increasingly to the private sector and what we might call techno-science. On the other hand, there's been an argument put forward by Ernest Boyer, who writing for the Craigie Foundation in the early 1990s, and then taken up by the argument around mode two, new knowledge production, which basically looks at increasingly the role of uh, the social contribution, if you want to say, of research. Um, Boyer looked at four different types of, of, of research and what he was getting at was really trying to say is that people who say that basic research is the only research out there are really trying to put in a hierarchy that doesn't really exist. And this really reflects issues around the changing role of the university. So we have issues around that Mark Charles says that once you have large numbers of people who are supporting and providing public funds to higher education and for higher education research, it's inevitable that people are going to start asking how that money is being spent and why it's being spent in certain ways. Craig Calhoun, who was at one stage in New York, a social science research council and then head of LSE, he talks about um, public good in terms of the fact that the public support for higher education will only be given insofar as higher education, the universities educate citizens in general and share knowledge as widely as possible. We also are saying for Jared Delante, looking at the central task now of the key actors of the university in the public sphere, the democratization of knowledge. And again, John Brewer talking on the social sciences and the impact of social science looks about the need to de redefine public value and to engage in this debate. Because often there is a tendency for the argument to move away and get out of the, the space and say, you've got it wrong, we're not going to engage. And what Brewer is saying is, we need to engage. So there are implications as we move for these changes in the way in which the university is seen in society and the implications that has for knowledge and the role of researchers and indeed academics is there are implications for the university itself. The first is that if research doesn't exist in isolation, which it doesn't, it has an impact somewhere, there are implications for how we organize and manage research, what, what's funded, and how its outcomes are measured. And we see in lots of countries a debate between whether or not research in higher education is there because it promotes and builds up um, smart graduates, or whether research in, in universities is about economic development. Whether we support issues around research or curiosity, 
research funding organizations, big issues around the alignment and what is the purpose of the funding of research. In the Irish case, we've had a big move towards alignment with national priorities. Do we fund excellence wherever it exists, or do we target research funding to particular institutions or fields in order to build capacity or scale? Do we encourage new and emerging fields, ideas that we don't know about, on the basis that things will come eventually, because that's where all great ideas come from, or do we prioritize existing strengths only? These issues make the boundary between science or knowledge and society more opaque. In other words, it's more difficult where these boundaries are. And it means that we need to integrate research and knowledge and education in order to ensure that we have a society and a population able and willing to engage in these debates, what I call a fully engaged active aging population, because as we live longer, we need to ensure that our population of all ages can engage in the, in the issues before them, the policy choices. So one more discussion then about this notion of innovation, which is a big issue for government. Um, innovation has been seen as a, as a fairly relatively new policy area, and it's been recently tied to research in universities on the basis that if we introduce innovation, we'll get more technology and economic growth out of it. Um, it tends to be associated with commercialization and technology. We're all familiar with this. Everyone wanting to build these high-tech regions. So everyone wants to be, be, build a Silicon Valley, a Route 128, which is outside Boston or indeed in Cambridge. And then this, this idea has spread everywhere. There's an emphasis on commercialization. This concept of third mission is predominantly dominated by this notion of commercialization. And we see these activities as taking on a life of their own. This goes back to some of the stuff on the academic capitalism argument. But I want to put to you that there's you know, contrasting models of how knowledge is created. On the left, the traditional linear model, I don't know if you can see my screen, is um, this notion that you come up with an idea, you innovate it, and then you produce it. So it's a linear model. Research creates an outcome or an artifact, which then comes into the marketplace. And economic and social benefit comes at the end of that. So it's either a new cure, or it's new jobs, or it's more taxes, or whatever it is. And to some extent, um, certainly with an emphasis on the traditional model, um, base, normally a basic research model, accountability is achieved primarily through peer review. We do the research at the beginning, we review it in our normal peer review process, and the outcome is the end. But as we move increasingly, what we know about innovation, what we know about how knowledge is produced, what we know about the fact that society is much more knowledgeable. It's a smarter population because most of these people are our graduates. We're now looking increasingly at what's called use-inspired or user-oriented open, open innovation. The EU is putting forward this notion of open innovation 2.0. And here what we're looking at is something that is much more multi-actor, multi where the university is, is engaging not just with, with uh, in what was called a triple helix with government and business, but with society, with lots of different social actors. So we have terms like co-production of knowledge, because the people that we're engaging with are equally knowledgeable, that they're helping to define the research project. From the, from the start, not just as um, citizen scientists looking at, you know, and tracking birds, but part and parcel of the research system. And accountability then is much more through active, engaged societal invent, and intervention, but also public endorsement. So is society happy with the issues? And in some countries, indeed Netherlands, there was a whole discussion about what were the big societal challenges? What do we want our researchers to focus on? 
So when we understand innovation in this sense, it's about simply something new that's put into practical use. And we've tended, as I said, to use it to describe science-based outcomes, but there's a big lag between discovery and practical applications. Um, and indeed, most innovation takes place outside of higher education. This idea that universities are going to make a lot of money through commercialization is an exception rather than the rule. Um, and from an innovation perspective, the most important thing that universities do is producing skilled knowledge workers or graduates who are able to catalyze the adoption of research and to use it in different ways in society. And this opens up particular avenues for the arts, humanities, and social sciences, where the techno-science version of innovation basically kept it within science and technology, new definitions of innovation, let the arts, humanities, and social sciences in as active participants, not as a sideline. So we're looking at innovation in all kinds of sectors, low-tech, service industries, outside private, between the public and the nonprofit sector. We're looking at reshaping the way we, we do things, do different kinds of products, different kinds of way in which we, we sell things, what's often called social innovation or frugal innovation. And in these kinds of ways, we're not trapped by the way in, in which we um, look at the way in which things ha have been done. Free trade is a really interesting example of, um, of social innovation using local workers or local farmers in different parts of the world. So when we look at arts and humanities and social science in this context, we see that there's a lot going on that's important to the arts, humanities, and social science. That interaction with and in society is vital, and that small changes can lead to innovation. That interaction is vital for research. Working collaboratively with industry and social partners has been shown to lead to generate more high-quality cited publications. Not less, but more. That there's lots of subfields across the disciplines that have a really strong connection with um, societal partners and indeed businesses. Um, and that we can look increasingly at non-commercial uses, environmental improvements, and other kinds of societal changes where the arts, humanities, and social sciences have a lot to contribute. It's also an important area when we innovate in education, looking at innovation in all, all aspects of, of the university, its interaction with society and stakeholders. And it can have a deeply transformative um, effect, both in anchoring um, the engagement in both the mission and governance of the university in a way that links teaching and research. So I want to put forward this notion of the ability of the arts, humanity, and social sciences to lead the pedagogical re, uh, revolution, and particularly in an area of what I, what I call uh, moving from STEM to STEAM. I recently um, chair the EU expert group on science education, and we produced a report called Science Education for Global Citizenship. What do we need to know as we get older, and how do we embrace the entire society? And STEAM is basically, obviously, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, with an A in it, where A is meant to refer to all other disciplines. And it's about the fact that increasingly, new ways of thinking and identifying solutions fall outside the boundaries of a single, of a single discipline. Really interesting thing happening at Alto um, University in, in um, Helsinki, where they bring Lots of students together across lots of disciplines, the university itself very interesting, um, working in these collaborative labs. So moving towards the end, so what will help us get a better understanding of the public value of our humanities and social science? One, looking at this concept of the civic university, we have that the responsibility of university to society is not new. We've been, we've arguably there, been there for, for centuries, 
but it's taken greater um, importance because of the, the range of issues that society um, and we have experienced over recent um, decades or recent years, even since the millennium. Um, one of the things we see is this merging of local and global problems. Issues that we thought were someone else's problems are ours. Migration. We see the impact across Europe, not just in terms of the number of people um, and how we're coping with that, but the political fallout all the way to the U.S. and the U.S. elections. Issues of disease, Ebola, uh, Zika virus, these things that we thought were someone else's problems, they're now our problems. Climate change, reverse. We thought that this was, again, someone else's problem, and it's our problem. So these kind of local, global issues are now on our doorstep. And the speed of the and depth of the crisis, economic crisis has also illustrated the fact that few of us, if any of us, have been able to insulate our countries from the interconnectivity of the global world. So this means that, that there's a real important way to open up for the arts, humanities, and social science to engage and exploit what I would call the engagement agenda, to bridge the gap between local and global and to better communicate and contextualize the university's role in its society while acting globally. So I define it as engaging in learning beyond the campus walls, discovery which is useful beyond the academic community, and service that directly benefits the public. And in this sense, the debate is really to move from economic impact to economic value, and ultimately from economic value to public value. In other words, it's not just about market transactions that we buy a product that signals that the public values something. The public signals its value in a lots of different ways. And the arts, humanities, social science creates societal benefits beyond the level of the immediate consumer. So, Lots and lots of different uh, transactions that are, that are embedded, as I mentioned at the very beginning, in artifacts and services that we don't necessarily think about. This intermingling of different publics through mass behavior, the way in which we watch TV, engage in public discourse, listen to the radio, um, the circulation of ideas, uh, the shaping of public discourse and behavior. Um, because we also know that science on its own, cure, you know, telling people to stop smoking is not working, and it's a much more of a issues around social behavioral issues. Indeed, one of the growth areas in economics is behavioral economics. So this is a diagram that's come from the assessment of the UK Research um, Excellence Framework on the impact. And we don't need to see the particulars, but what it's trying to demonstrate is the overlapping significance across all the disciplines, the way in which the impact of what comes across has an impact in a very wide discursive way, and that it's through this myriad ways that the public benefits. So rather than going back to that linear model of, of producing research, producing, you know, and then ending up with a product at the end, we have a much more dispersed and interactive effect, and it's the total net effect of how we create value. It's what my colleague would call, ben, uh, Paul Benwith would call the ripples how played out in society. And another similar type of drawing was done by Bolin and colleagues, and they again looked at the interlapping between different disciplines. So it's the arts, humanities, and social sciences plays a role in the wider knowledge economy, not just in its own field, and not simply as a tag-along evaluator of science. And that tends to be another set of problems. So this is my way of describing how what we tend to do when we try and measure research is we measure what's above the line. We measure journal articles and peer esteem. But you can see there's a wide range of impacts 
and outcomes and values that occur that we don't count, that we don't think about, that are very difficult to ascertain. So what should be done? What can be done at the university? Given the fact that this is about the University of Porto looking at its strategy. Well, a couple of suggestions. One, embedding the concept of the civic university, using the dynamism of arts, humanities, and social uh, science to better position the university regionally and internationally, drawing on the kinds of things that are regionally embedded and nationally relevant. Adopting a dynamic view of innovation, so it's not just the idea of it's science te and technology producing a product, it's about your students and graduates, who after all are the biggest product of higher education, who facilitate the absorption of world knowledge and contribute to a shared pool of knowledge and society. They're the biggest product. They're the innovation on two legs, as it's often called. Incentivize greater engagement between and with other disciplines, but critically with wider society. So embracing STEAM rather than STEM. Using and integrating real-life problems to fuel learning in the classroom, develop students, putting them up against problems and challenges that necessitate drawing upon interdisciplinary teams, working together, and with people and organizations outside higher education in order to solve them. Look at the way in which you measure and value within the university for promotion, recruitment, um, student work, and so on, the way in which research is valued. And finally, embed new management practices within the university to support these initiatives and demonstrate that the university values and engage scholarship. Thank you very much. I This is a new book that myself and my colleagues have coming out that discusses some of these issues um, and it's due out um, next month. Thank you very much. So, Professor Azel Korn's presentation points out the emergent challenge posed to the social sciences and humanities by the mounting influence of government priorities emphasizing economic relevance, the commercialization as alternative to public spending on research, or the bibliographical indexation. She also points out that, taken together, these strategies promoted mostly defensive positions among the academic community. Under such urgencies and pressures, it can even manifest itself in a siege mentality. For me, her statements were genuinely interesting since they suggest an escape route to the mortal alternative that can appear among social scientists in reaction to this changed policy environment. For the presentation's sake, let's use a very simplified version. On the one side, we have the more or less pragmatic, in the worst case, cynical attitudes towards the existence of external stakeholders where scientists settle for a passive role as policy recipients or just service providers. On the other side, we have the nihilist reaction that flatly refuse the mere mention of any external petition, mens mensuration, or assessment. Professor Azelkorn's advocates instead a proactive role for the social science and humanities that is contrary to both those extreme positions. Not only we are thus opening up a way to dismiss the existential anxiety that crosses the social science and humanities, but we can suggest more realistic and reliable ways of measuring the contribution of these disciplines. The submission to unidimensional modes of appreciation and categorization of scientific innovation, reducing it either to its marketing success or to its bibliographical impact, leaves aside precisely the polyvalent impacts of scientific knowledge and, in particular, their social value. So, and to go beyond the mere diagnosis, let me share with you a personal reading of her research experience. Every year, we have more than 150,000 labor accidents in Portugal. Besides the workers having their lives seriously affected this way, we can sum up the six to seven million workdays lost every year and or the massive burden on the health system. Any improvement in the preve prevention of these events means a huge contribution to these workers' well-being and also a massive economic contribution to the country. A research project on the institutional and personal trajectories of the injured workers can promote a better understanding of many opaque dimensions 
and besides, contribute with concrete proposals to the public services. How should, we, how should the results of such a project be measured? Notice that we are not rebucking the use of bibliographic or commercial dimensions in such measurements, but wondering on the means to grasp the social overreach of such project while at the same time retaining other outputs as important variables. Should the positive answer to that question be found, what are the multidimensional methods of evaluation that can be adopted to suit this renewed definition of academic entrepreneurship? I am thinking namely on the impacts in the circulation or transfer of knowledge with civic society organizations, in the dissemination of knowledge among a lay audience and not exclusively among fellow scientists, or the very slow consequences over the policy being applied by public institutions. To speak as an aren't, is there a polytheistic model to ascertain both the epistemological specificities of the academic disciplines, the social uses and appropriations of knowledge, and finally, not only the immediate, but also the dispersed and long-term consequences of science and society? Ready for something very different now? Uh, we are going to present you uh, a most important topic. Uh, uh, Art-based futures uh, is our topic. Uh, quite unusual in times uh, when everybody is talking about uh, technology. Uh, but uh, we want to give you an impression what we mean by a future being based on the arts. Enjoy. Well, there are two dominant approaches for art-based research. The first approach, the research is an investigation into the arts themselves, in search for new aesthetic dimensions, new layers of meaning. In the second one, the arts are used as tools to increase or at least stimulate knowledge production outside the system of the arts, maybe in social, political, or scientific issues. This approach follows the concept of infiltrating, we heard that term already today, and thus enriching research. Like uh, some decades ago, quantitative methods infiltrated research in, for example, economics, history, or even psychology. Or like physics infiltrated and enriched medicine by radiography or magnetic resonance or computer tomography. Herbert Marcuse once said, the truth of art lies in its power to break 
the monopoly of the established reality to define what is real. The world of art is that of another reality principle of alienation. And only as alienation does art fulfill a cognitive function. Art communicates truths not communicable in any other language. Almost a century after Heisenberg formulated the uncertainty principle and his theory of quantum mechanics has broken the paradigms of physics and even philosophy, we are still accustomed to arguing and acting largely along causality patterns which are linear within insulated boxes of fragmented sciences. In a scientific theory, even before it is proved, you know that it is correct because it is aesthetically satisfying. One uses criteria that go far beyond what is called logical deduction. These are not words of some obscure esoteric. No, it was Wolf Singer, the former director of the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research, who wrote this. The mission both of art and science is to explain the world, not just to scale or to picture it. And the world in its large and small dimensions only can be understood in a multi-dimensional, non-linear way of thinking and perceiving. However, in our current system, academic careers are built along the lines of a single discipline or even sub-discipline. The discourse within the scientific community is a major element of theory validation, theory falsification, and theory production. To gain validity, this discourse has to follow the methods and the limits of a certain single discipline. But at the same time, we know about the increasing complexity of our world. And ironically enough, neural networks today are a major topic in research. Reality is a construction, we are told by philosophers. In any case, reality is the result of description and interpretation. As a matter of fact, art-based research has the capacity to enrich the conversation about interpretations and meanings by providing sensitivity for non-linear extra-moral perceptions beyond the limits of disciplines. The performance you saw before took place at the, at the Natural History Museum in Vienna. Several artists were invited to reflect on the findings of the salt caves in Hallstatt. The scientists showed us the world. To understand the language and their musts and don'ts took a long time and raised a lot of questions. The way they store their treasures were inspiring for me. What does it mean to find something in a next step, refer it and rate it. It comes to evaluation, which is very marked by the circumstances in, of the find, the person dealing with the find and the worldview. In the beginning, some scientists say, it could be like this, it's a model. But mostly this part of information sinks into oblivion. When the models are visualized, we believe this is reality. 
an evaluation and classification carried out is of temporary validity. Depending on which new knowledge or findings are gained, the model must be changed or revised. So what I did was to assemble personal findings, leftovers and new parts to, ten, to 10 body wraps. Every collection has its own name like tracking or Bruce. In the exhibition, the scientists and the artists did in the same room, each collection found place in its special drawer. In the video you saw, the performers found treasures. Every one of them had to evaluate and classificate each piece and decide where to put it on his body. So it happens automatically that the viewer starts to think, what is this? And maybe also, where would I place this object? The true beauty of art lies in its ability to move us emotionally and intellectually, to motivate us following new paths, to shape awareness, and to evoke imaginations. Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Who had the imagination to fly a man to the moon? No, it was not John F. Kennedy. It was not the NASA. It was Jules Verne, 100 years before, with his book, De la Terre à la Lune. The breakthrough from the geocentric to the heliocentric model came along with the invention of the central perspective in Renaissance painting, which was somehow necessary for finding this way of viewing at the world from a fixed central point outside the globe. The paintings of Seurat can also be seen as pixeled pictures, a technique or rather technology that would be used some 60 years later for television. And Picasso disintegrated in his paintings the visual and intellectual interrelation between material, form, time, and space. A person is falling apart, or we can look at a person from different points at the same time. This happened a few years before Einstein wrote his theory of relativity and Heisenberg defined the uncertainty principle. But no doubt, in innovation based on science and technology will be dominating future developments even more and even faster than ever in the past. But more than ever, science and technology will need the arts to make the big leaps rather than the small steps towards the future of our civilization. A small step for me, but a giant leap for mankind, said Neil Armstrong. What remained from that giant leap for mankind? Fascinating technology, by sure, technology which was heavily refined in the following years. But what would have happened if NASA had involved artists like Stanley Kubrick, Joseph Beuys, John Cage, or philosophers like, for example, Jean-Paul Sartre? What would have happened if NASA would have implemented these kind of people into the Apollo program? Just imagine. Google hired Ray Kurzweil, the author, computer scientist, futurist, founder of a paradigm-breaking synthesizer music system and of cyber art technologies. He now is Google's engineering director. His task there is to enter new dimensions of artificial intelligence applications. 
and he does quite well. Go is a game where you have many possibilities. A one with 171 zeros, that is more than the number of atoms in the universe, Google says. In March 2016, this year, the supercomputer AlphaGo, designed by the Google company DeepMind, won a five-game series against the Go world champion, Lee Sedol, by four to one. Artificial intelligence defeated human intelligence in the most challenging game on Earth. In China, where the game was invented nearly 3,000 years ago, Go was considered as one of the four essential arts, aside music, calligraphy, and painting. And it still is seen as an artistic rather than a cognitive experience, a game where intuition is equally important as logics. The supercomputer's intelligence is based on millions of Go positions and moves from human played games. Interesting is what observers detected when analyzing the game series between the master and the computer. The Go champion lost because he tended to act in the database logics of the computer and not in the tradition of a Go master in an art-based intuitive way. Quite interesting, isn't it? If our thinking, our education, our culture is narrowed to a mechanistic complexity, relying on activation and recombination of the existing one, zero, no, right, wrong, right, guilty, not guilty, black, white, foreigner, native. If this happens, then we give space to machines dominating the future, dominating humans. Machines cannot create what did not exist yet. They can create new combinations out of existing parts, sometimes even surprising combinations, but they cannot create anything which did not exist before. They do not have emotions, they can recognize emotions. They can imitate emotions, but all limited to patterns of emotions which were stored earlier. Never before in history humans had so much knowledge. Worldwide there are 34,550 peer-reviewed scientific journals. 2.5 million scientific papers are published every year. And less than every 20 seconds a scientific paper is being published. And nevertheless, people increasingly feel scared from uncertainty and ambiguity. Dealing with ambiguity, uncertainty, and complexity, creating seemingly weird connections and opening up totally new perspectives is familiar terrain for artists. So surely there should be a lot of potential for fruitful collaboration between art and sciences without calling into question their different identities. Similar to the Renaissance when the reason-led man came into competition to God, we are now again facing dramatic changes in our worldview and our confidence in the future. The challenges we have to meet within the next 25 years are located on a cultural, a technological, and a social level at the same time. And the borders between these levels are becoming blurred. The questions deriving from these challenges 
only will be answered by cross-disciplinary research methods. What is the mission of mankind in a world of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the biotechnological merge of man and machine? For the first time in history, machines do not just replace human muscle power, machines are replacing human brain power. How much will the effects of global warming and global migration change physical as well as social landscapes? Will we succeed in redefining and creating new forms of human work when up to 50% of the now existing jobs will break away due to robotics and artificial intelligence? And which social fabric is needed in an urbanized and aging society? Art-based approaches will have to enrich the interpretation of facts and perceptions in order to achieve more than assembling isolated parts of a fragmented reality. Vilda Mensch is an art-based research on the, <laughs> on the preconditions of social inclusion of people living with dementia. It aims to influ influence public awareness about dementia. I'm a social designer and an artist, and you may ask yourself why an artist is interested in, theme, in this theme. My roots are biochemistry and midwifery, so I do have a close relation to medicine, and I'm used to work with people. My colleague, Antonia Egeling, is a designer, and she already worked on the theme dementia. We went to shared flats for people living with dementia, daycare centers and shared flats for senior citizens. We found out that some of the main problems people living with dementia do have are feeling insecure, having problems with orientation, sensual overload, and feeling ashamed related to fear of stigmatization. What if we offer people in the street the possibility to experience these special situations people living with dementia have to, to deal with in the early stage of this disease? We came out with two objects, one mainly visual and the other mainly auditory. The audio we developed asks you to fulfill several tasks while you hear various noises. Some of the tasks had to be fulfilled at the same time. To stay focused in this situation is really difficult. What one can experience with this headset and the MP3 player is sensual overload. It is produced by noises we hear in everyday life in a city, but mixed in an extreme way. People in the early stage of dementia often say that this constant stream of music commercials and lots of other noises are exhausting for them. That's why it's hard for them to stay focused in this kind of environment. With this object, one can experience shame and overstimulation. The loss of orientation and the feeling insecure reminded me of an art object I created in 2011, and it's called Fokung Virkus. In the exhibition at the Arte Laguna Venice, it hung down from the ceiling. The object was inspired by Plata's allegory of the cave. It shows the surrounding fragmented, upside down and left to right reversed. Additionally, you see the world around you in an unusual distance. Each lens of this object has, to, has its own characteristic. This, this very first prototype of one lens I brought with me. Um, combined with the task to re reach a destination, Fokung Virkus is situated to experience uncertainty, disorientation and maybe shame. Before people put on the object, we ask them to choose a goal they want to reach and not too far away. Then they start to wa walk with the object on their head. It is very 
different how people behave and react in this situ situation, but all of them need some time to orientate and to figure out which moves brings them closer to the chosen goal. The theme of guidance also pops up during the intervention. We offered Phil Dementia at, differ at different places in Vienna to passers-by. Subsequently, we made interviews and asked the person to fill out feedback cards. Wow, yeah. 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 wow really insecure. Scary. Disorienting. This is the same comic. But I'm just a bit slow. Every time it's so interesting to notice how the intervention leads people into the theme. What happens is a real reflection on the sensory overload, how insecure, insecurity affects their behavior and much more. This experience gives them the idea of being confused and disorientated. Now they can talk about the loss of orientation, about shame, and they can start to think about what it means for them to need help, to ask for help, or to accept help and guide, uh, guidance. The main reason why I like this intervention so much is that I can feel the shift from the difficult issue of dementia that is related to a lot of fear and dark emotions to something that has a playful character by taking the effects from the early stage dementia serious. Based on the collected feedback, a communication tool was produced. It's called What If. It provides the chance to enter the complex issue of dementia with the means of tactile, visual, and auditory perception for a larger number of people, regardless of the intervention. All what you can read and hear are quotes from people having participated in the interventions feel dementia. The special construction and the content of the tool also focus on disorientation, uncertainty and overstimulation. And based on the work of Phil Dementia, we got a peer-reviewed grant from the Austrian National Science Fund, where a special funding program for artistic research is established. At the beginning of March, we started a project that will last for three years and is located on the, at the University of Applied Arts Vienna under the lead of Professor Ruth Matthias Baer. The title of the research project is Dementia Arts Society, Artistic Research on Patterns of Perception and Action in the Context of an Aging Society. This art-based research project tries to answer the question, how can art and design strategies ease the life of people with dementia by enabling them to take part with their respective capabilities in social life as long as possible? Maybe I can tell you more about the next conference. So, art cannot change societies, but art can change people, and people can change societies. And yes, the future will be art-based. Thank you. Maybe we should turn now to our internal discussants, uh, who will make some comments regarding this, and then we'll give the, the round back to you, okay? C can I start? Yeah, yeah. okay. Well, I, I left aside the introduction to my, to my, to my own comment um, a while ago, but I, now, now I, I will do it. I think it, is, it, it could be quite interesting. Well, well uh, first of all, let me thank the organizing team. Uh, more than a simple courtesy, I truly think that such a debate on the future of the university <laughs> brings a very special contribution to the role the academic institutions wish to play in our societies. Maybe it is already a symptom of the university's improved awareness on its own entitlement and obligation. I can try to explain with very brief words why this is a relatively innovative initiative. Historically, the intellectuals constituted themselves as a community through a constant struggle to protect their independence and autonomy from competing symbolic producers. Reinhard Kozlek's classical work, Critique on Crisis, shows us that this explains the relevant emphasis the intellectuals placed on the critique of other institutions, 
such as the absolutist monarchy or the Catholic Church. However, the same author states that such deep commitment with the critic of external powers with a moral or political character meant that the intellectuals were much less prone in developing dispositions and instruments to conduct their own critique. For such reason, Kozlek continues, they tended to remain in a hypocritical state for too long. Occasions like the one we are now, where we are invited to reflect collectively upon our mission as an academic community, mean that the university has learned, meanwhile, that so important as the analysis of the surrounding world could be the development of self-reflexive mechanisms. I will try to contribute actively to such a discussion, presenting my comments also in the form of shared questions. I do it earlier with Professor Zazelkorn's uh, presentation to the comments of the pr Professor Zazelkorn. I will do now to Professor Gerald and Cornelia Bast's um, presentation. Well, they, they, tr they trial paths when they meditate on the meaning of, that hearts may have for the changes undergoing in academia and in general in our planet. Their account highlights not only the virtues of promoting more than suppressing the plurality of approaches while dealing with inherently polemic issues such as progress or future, but they also highlight the advantage of taking into consideration the suggestions and contributions of those, <coughs> of those who, by definition, work with uncertainty and ambiguity, the artists. Against the waste of artistic experience by the scientific disciplines, Professors Cornelia and Gerald sustained that the artistic process and projects, given their intrinsically systematic strategy of questioning and their adequacy to unconventional contexts, are especially suitable to strength otherwise monodisciplinary approaches to grand global challenges. As one of their fellow citizens from Vienna wrote some hundred years ago, amidst the cataclysmic times of the First World War, and I'm quoting, the pedagogical obligation to any nation that has grown amidst incommensurable uncertainties and menaces is learning to see abysses there where common places lie, giving a remedy to the journalistic rhetoric, the nationalistic passions, or the stereotypes of social life. This option means to spread the doubts and the questioning, which is, in Karl Krauss' words, the greatest moral gift mankind can thank language. My question here, pushing further Karl Krauss' words in his magazine Die Fackel, is to know whether universities cannot be more, more, cannot be more than just providers of tailored service, already made solutions, acting instead as a source of unanticipated and defying interpolations, aspirations, and responsibilities for the society at large. In troubled times like the ones we seem to live now, I wonder the role the university can play as a promoter of methodical reason and ethical principles, becoming a source of proposals and standards and not merely mimicking the society. And I understand correctly Professor Gerald and Cornelia's words, art-based research is specially suited for this endeavor. I will then ask how can we operationalize this joint relation between scientific and artistic approaches that challenge the Procrustean bed of the insulated disciplines without compromising their epistemic or institutional autonomy? Is it possible, or should we also change the structural frame where this should take place? Thank you so much. Katerina? Thank you very much for being here. Uh, I, I will start by thanking the rector and vice rector for inviting me to be here. Well, the two conferences were really very challenging for me uh, in terms of questioning and allowing me to push these issues of research and the arts, or research in the arts. I will be, be talking uh, from a specific position, that is my position at the Faculty of Fine Arts uh, and at uh, its research institute, and understanding this place of commenting as more an engagement uh, with some <coughs> of the ideas and questions that were here presented today. I will be focusing three main gestures, difference, plurality, and suspension. Actually, what kind of arguments are in play when we talk about researching and the arts? This is not a new debate. Those notions of research in the arts, arts-based research, or art as research. But actually, the arts 
And again, I'm talking about the Faculty of Fine Arts and its research institutes are still fighting on a daily basis, on one side for recognition, and on the other side, there is an internal battle with the word research itself. This is due to the fact that art disciplines do not have a recognized research tradition, or at least a research tradition as we usually consider to be research, for instance, in the sciences. So this is a kind of a problem of identity, because this identity of research is felt as imposed from the exterior. At least to me, something became very obvious today. To research in the arts is different from researching in science or technology. So how can we ask the arts to be equal in terms of outputs, in terms of publications and forums of discussion? That is an important question that some scholars and universities are now reflecting on and it is very significant that we are having these discussions at the University of Porto in a Congress to think about the future. But what is to think about the future of research in the arts? Can we predict what it will be? Can we determine what it will become? I'm not sure we can, or even if we should do that in that way. But I'm very much interested in being in the game, and at the same time to be disobedient to the deterministic, not questioned norms that define what is research and how research has to be presented and performed. I am more connected to the possibility of dissensus rather than consensus in the meanings of research. Not knowing what exactly artistic research is, maybe is a good thing for some reasons. No external scaffold can replace the work that is required to make research in the arts, and maybe this is true for other fields too, but research in the arts is not, at the same time, artistic practice in itself. And for the benefit of art, it is good that it is not. If we are talking about a performance, about a concert, about a painting, about an exhibition, we are not talking about research, but we also can be talking about research when we refer to those things. If that is the case, then I think that we have to find forms of documentation of the practice in order to enhance conversations about the practice as research, opening it, exposing it, questioning and discussing. And sometimes the problem is also the refusal of discussion itself. Well, I think that several questions emerged today from these two conferences. Do we have to play the games that determine, for instance, that Scopus is the barometer of excellence? How can we show that other ways of thinking are possible? How can universities live with these pressures of rankings, productivity, speed, and at the same time be aware of the time that is needed to produce new knowledge? Are we more interested in knowledge or in knowing? Can we be disobedient within these apparatus of government? I think that Ellen's, Gerald's and Cornelia's interventions made evident that maybe it's more important to better understand what really matters <coughs> when we talk about research and the other and arts, rather than what is easily measured. We, and here I'm talking specifically about research institute in which I'm working now, we also publish in Scopus indexed journals, or at least we try to. We also apply for funding, stating outputs that are easily recognized within the broad language of research, but we fight for a plurality. We are very aware that research in the arts, and I'm not exactly talking about research through the arts, is sometimes difficult to identify and to describe. It is not only a question of not knowing how to talk about research in the arts, but perhaps about inventing new methods and ways of talking, discussing, and presenting. I'm really more interested in the present than in the future of research. It is becoming a common sense but we are always listening that we do not have time to research. And this means that we do not have time for slowness, for suspension, for thinking, for failing. I know that institutions always have to think in the terms of future, and particularly educational institutions, because education is all about to prepare and to govern the future. 
The problem is that we are always talking about those that are yet to come. Can we suspend this desire for the future? That's my third issue. Chronologically speaking, I'm very much interested in the present. Can we ask about research in terms of trying to understand what we are doing instead of what it will be, without determining with exactitude what it will be good for? I'm interested in trying to figure out what can we discuss about research without the buzzwords and, for me, toxic words, measuring, impact, validity, excellence, entrepreneurship, employability. Measurements, of course, don't happen in abstract or neutral terms. They are part of apparatus, they are part of power-knowledge relations, they are agential practices that not only <coughs> reveal things or numbers, but are performative in a way that they constitute what is being, being measured as such. In these processes, other ways of thinking are excluded. In accepting all these pressures coming from other fields, universities are not concentrating in their primordial educational and cultural missions. Numbers will never replace thinking. Taking the challenge of our times that Gerald and Cornelia characterize in terms of complexity, change and uncertainty, I'm interested in constructing possibilities of thinking about research in the <coughs> arts, in which we can think, in which we can be engaged in knowing through doing, in which we can go beyond the dichotomic walls, in which we can question and stay in questions rather than trying to find the right answers. A space in which we can also think about not knowing and learning to unlearn. It means to open ourselves to the possibilities of moving towards unanticipated directions to deal with the potentialities of failure. <coughs> in terms of research and the arts, it means several things. But one of them is that the obsession with knowing that and what we do not know yet. It is not about knowledge as a normative practice, but about questioning these procedures and how they constitute ourselves. So non-linear interpretations to go beyond the disciplines, to raise questions, I think that these were the main thoughts that made me think more listening to these two conferences today. So thank you very much.